everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. The ASC and the IAC are pleased to present the basics of using contracts. I'm Beverly Gorman, the IAC Director of Accreditation for Echocardiography. I have just a few housekeeping items to go over with you before we begin the presentation. Only registered participants of the live conference are eligible for the CME credit. At the end of the presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session in which all your questions will be answered by the presenters. Um, and this conference is being recorded and will be posted on the IAC ECHO website in the next week or so um, for you to review. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Ray Stainbeck. He is the president of the um, IAC Board of Directors for the Echocardiography Division and is also um, on the Board of Directors for the IAC. Uh, I'll not now turn the presentation over to Dr. Stainbeck. Dr. Stainbeck? Thank you, Beverly. You're and welcome. <laughs> Welcome to all our participants. Uh, we are showing the Evolve slide here because uh, February 2012 is a pivotal, pivotal moment in the history of the IAC. We now have a new look, and you will be seeing uh, a lot of positive changes, I think, in the IAC this year. And this is the echocardiography division of the IAC. Uh, this is our first educational component. but this is also a time where we wanted to just point out that a lot of research, both internally and externally, uh, has gone into uh, a few changes uh, that, we are, that we've made. And this is with a lot of forethought and purpose and a lot of feedback from our customers. So it's fair to say that our accreditation process has evolved over the last 20 plus years. And we think to a higher level that we believe is the best in the industry with regards to accreditation. Um, in recent years, we've uh, tightened up somewhat the requirements for incorporating contrast use into echo lab protocols, and we receive a lot of questions in this area. And so I think it's appropriate that we start with a contrast uh, webinar this year. I also wanted to point out that the American Society of Echo is a partner in this webinar, and I'd encourage you to please visit their home page on the website. And if you go to the second tab at the top, there's one called the Contrast Zone. And you can find a wealth of information of uh, contrast material here, uh, including some of the things that we'll talk about today and also more. If you look at the, the slide I have posted here, you can see where the echocardiography division fits under the IAC, the Intersocial Accreditation Commission. And we've been around since 1996. And this new graphic shows how all the divisions are under the IAC. And so now we've really streamlined the process whereby uh, institutions that are seeking multimodality accreditation would have a much easier time of this and that the divisions are more linked under one parent company. This is our new look in the echocardiography division. And so if you are an accredited lab, you'll be receiving uh, things in the mail or your new certifications that have these look as opposed to our old logo. And so the future IAC commitments are really to have a much more streamlined process that things are clear, easy, and effective, and you won't be trapped in this labyrinth of paperwork and different requirements. It'll be much more straightforward. This will be rewarding and educational for the lab. It will be inclusive, and all this under one IAC. Right now, I'd like to uh, say that we're privileged to hear from our guest speakers here, Dr. Paul Grayburn and Dr. Michael Main. Both of our guests have extensive backgrounds in echocardiography and cardiology and clinical research, which in recent years has included publication of major clinical research for further establishing the safety of contrast use. Both have served in leadership positions, and a number of them in the American Society of Echocardiography. Dr. Paul Grayburn uh, was 
at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center for over 15 years, where he was the director of the echocardiography lab and chief of cardiology at the Dallas VA Medical Center. And since 2002, he's been the chairman of cardiology research and education at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. He has an in-depth interest in a variety of novel clinical uh, programs relating to heart disease, generally interventional cardiology, echocardiography, and also novel therapeutic applications for microbubbles. Our second speaker, Dr. Main, was a cardiovascular disease fellow at the University of Te uh, Texas in Southwestern in Dallas. He completed advanced cardiac imaging fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. And now he's the medical director of the echocardiography lab at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City. And he's also a professor of medicine at the University of Missouri in, in uh, Kansas City. He's a, a real expert with regard to uh, safety issues and contrast use. And I will now hand over the session to Dr. Paul Grayburn. Thanks, Ray. I appreciate that. And. Uh, I'm going to start out really talking about uh, how to give contrast agents because in our own hospital, I find that uh, a lot of the times when we don't get good pictures or we're not happy with uh, with what contrast does, it's because we didn't actually administer it uh, correctly. So just to remind you, I think everybody knows this, microbubble contrast agents are designed to pass through the smallest capillaries uh, so they can get from the venous circulation across the lungs safely without occluding the pulmonary vasculature. And since capillaries tend to be about five microns in diameter, it's important to make these microbubbles smaller than that. They also uh, resonate in an ultrasound field and that gives them this different acoustic, acoustic impedance signal. So they provide a very bright uh, signal on echo and a very bright harmonic signal in particular. Uh, now, um, I'm going to show you a video clip uh, that was done by us uh, fairly recently. This is a 3D echo done in an important uh, clinical trial where the idea was to measure volumes and ejection fraction. And you can see that this really isn't a, a very good uh, picture, and we can't really accurately measure LV volumes here. So uh, needless to say, uh, what we did is give contrast. Yeah, let's see. Are you seeing this video, everybody? It's not, it's not really showing on my computer. There it is. Yeah, okay. So here you can see the same patient after giving a contrast agent. Now you can clearly see the endocardial borders. We were clearly able to accurately define the apex here and the uh, mitral annulus and draw this and get uh, a very high-quality LV volumes and ejection fraction. And this is really the main reason, I think, that we use contrast today is to look at LV endocardium. Uh, now, uh, when we do this, you can do it either with a bolus, which most people use because it's simple, or an infusion. And we'll talk first about the technique of bolus administration. You need to use tiny doses, uh, 0.1 to 0.4 ML. So what we use is we take a tuberculin syringe and draw very small doses uh, with this, uh, or we'll uh, then mix that in with saline in a larger syringe. So you never want to flush that vigorously. And where we see trouble with this is sometimes uh, a nurse maybe who's not a sonographer and is used to flushing medications will take a 10 cc flush syringe and blast the contrast in and it causes uh, attenuation and you really can't see anything. So it's crucial if you're going to use a bolus to use small doses and give a very slow saline flush by syringe, or you can even chase the bolus with a saline drip, adjusting the rate to get good imaging. Here's an example uh, of uh, a video clip of attenuation. This is a, you know, a patient in our uh, lab that uh, got contrast and then a big bolus flush uh, of saline and you can see that the mitral annulus is totally obliterated so you can see the apex pretty well but you really wouldn't be able to trace this ventricle for volumes or ejection fraction because the annulus is obliterated so this is not what we want to do that's a, a bad image uh, due to attenuation now <clears throat> 
One way to get around that kind of image is to give an infusion, and this is actually what I strongly prefer in our lab. And uh, this is the technique for Definity. I'll show you the technique for Optison in a minute. Uh, one can take a vial of Definity, and of course you activate it in the little dental amalgamator, and then inject the entire vial uh, in a 50 cc saline bag. And you can use a dial of flow for uh, rate adjustment. You start about one drop per second and adjust up or down as needed in that individual patient to see the endocardial borders. So if the patient has a really poor ejection fraction, uh, maybe a cardiomyopathy, you might have to give a little faster rate. And if they're hyperdynamic, a little slower rate, but you have to just simply adjust the rate. And you want to be able to visualize the endocardial borders without obliterating the mitral annulus. Most of the infusion pumps that you have in the intensive care units actually destroy the bubbles, so it's important not to use those. Uh, small IVs uh, or small needles can destroy the bubbles, so generally you want to use an 18-gauge needle, although we've found that even 22-gauge uh, IV catheters work pretty well. This is what it looks like, uh, and, and I think this picture is on the contrast zone of the ASE website, which Dr. Stainback mentioned earlier. So you can go and, and find these same slides I'm showing you uh, on the ASE website. So here you take uh, a 50 cc uh, bag and you inject uh, the Definity in there and you can basically adjust the rate as you need it. And then every once in a while you can reach up and give the bag a little squeeze just to keep an even distribution of the microbubbles within the bag. Very simple technique. You can do a similar thing with Optison. Uh, there's uh, a couple of different ways to do this. Rather than putting the Optison in the bag, we tend to fill the IV line uh, with Optison and then slowly chase it in via a saline infusion. Optison is tricky because it tends to stick to different types of plastics. So if you put it in the bag, it'll stick to the walls and not necessarily get into the patient. So uh, you have to chase it with saline or a dial of flow, and every once in a while you can shake the IV line or tap on it with your fingers to prevent Optison from sticking to the sides and to kind of keep it mixed. Uh, but it works pretty well, and we use both Definity and Optison to, to kind of get uh, a pretty infusion with good imaging. Now here's a, a slide that sort of illustrates the difference between a bolus or an infusion. And so with a bolus, you get a very rapid peak in the plasma concentration, and then it tails off rapidly. And so, uh, you know, that can be advantageous, but it can also hurt you. Uh, it, you have minimal time for imaging because the bolus washes in and washes out. You get very high initial concentrations, but that leads to attenuation artifacts, as I showed you earlier. So here's what an infusion looks like. An infusion gives you uh, less of a high concentration but it lasts a lot longer. So you have a prolonged duration of contrast enhancement, a more constant level of enhancement, and a lot fewer attenuation artifacts. So I, again, prefer to use an infusion uh, whenever I can. Now, instrument settings are also important. And as most of you know, harmonic imaging was really invented uh, to uh, image microbubbles and, and contrast agents, although we've found that it's useful for seeing uh, endocardial borders also. Uh, one needs to lower the mechanical index on the machine, the MI setting, to avoid microbubbles destruction. The higher the transmit power, the more likely you are to destroy the bubbles. And there are times when we want to do that, particularly in perfusion imaging. But for most of what we do, to look at the heart, to look at endocardial border definition, we really don't want to destroy the bubbles. We want to have them in there so we can see them and see what we're doing. You may need to adjust the focus. Uh, the focus should be set at the apex if you're looking at the apex for apical thrombus or wall motion. But if you're trying to trace the left ventricular volumes and ejection fraction, you need to see the mitral leaflet insertion. So you, in, that, in that case, you want to set the, the focus at the mitral annulus level, because if you don't see that level, you'll never know exactly where to trace the left ventricle. Most of the manufacturers have contrast presets built into the machines, and that's really what you want to use. So I'm not going to go into detail about exactly what those settings are because they're already well-established for everybody's machine. 
uh, and those modalities that the companies all have on their machines include harmonic imaging, power Doppler, pulse inversion imaging, power modulation, coherence imaging, ultra harmonic or sub harmonics, and it it's really not important which one of those you use. Uh, it's just simply important to find the one that works best for you and set it up on your machine. Uh, however, one of the things that's important with all of these different modalities is to remember that you're trying to look at bubbles, and uh, and so you really want to suppress the tissue. And this is a mistake some people make when they're about to give a contrast agent is they turn the gains up, they make the echo bright like we normally would, and then you don't see the bubbles as well. Uh, so it actually turns out that it's important to suppress tissue and enhance contrast, and that's shown on this slide. I'm going to see if I can make this little arrow work. If you look here at a transmit frequency of 1.3 down here on the left, okay, uh, you'll see that the tissue signal in in green uh, is higher than the contrast signal, which is shown in gray, and and so you really don't see the contrast very well. That's with fundamental imaging. If you now go to harmonics where you're receiving at 2.6, let's see again if I can make that arrow show up there, uh, you'll see that now you've got the contrast signal uh, just a little bit higher than the, uh, than there, thank you, the, than the green uh, uh, signal from tissue, but still it's not a lot higher. There's not a lot of advantage there. And so in this case with with ultra harmonics, which is out at 3.6, you really obliterated the tissue signal, and all you're looking at is the contrast agent. That takes some getting used to if you haven't done that uh, in, when you're doing contrast, but you really want to knock down the tissue signals before the contrast comes in. And when you do that, the images will be a lot better than maybe you're getting now. Let me show you some uh, cases uh, and uh, just some, some standard run-of-the-mill kind of cases that we see. Uh, here's an example that's pretty good. You can see the uh, bubbles in there. You can see the endocardial borders. You can see the mitral annulus, and you'd be able to easily trace this. Uh, but what I want to point out here is how important it is to set the focus at the mitral annulus. And you can see that uh, right over here, if I can get that arrow to stay there. There we go. Uh, notice that the focus is set at the mitral annulus here so that we can really see that without attenuation. Now here's another case, uh, and this is one where, again, the tissue signal here is really dark. Before the contrast showed up, you can't see much tissue. Uh, now you can see a beautiful picture, and uh, what I want to focus on here is the MI setting. If you look at this little white bar at the upper left hand, uh, portion here, you see that the MI setting is 0.4, so it normally comes up 1.2 or 1.5 or something like that on the machine. We've dialed it down to 0.4 so that we don't destroy the bubbles and we can see what we're looking at. Here's some more case examples coming up. Uh, those, those last two were just sort of to focus on setting the focus at the right area and turning the MI down. Now here's some real uh, clinical cases, and uh, hopefully you can see this. Uh, this is a patient that actually has a pretty normal-looking four-chamber view. Uh, and in fact, when you looked at all the views in this patient, they all look pretty normal. And a lot of patients, with a lot of uh, doctors and sonographers would say, well, I don't really need contrast. Uh, that's good enough, and I can see that the wall motion is normal. But here's the same patient. Uh, after getting uh, a contrast injection. And you can see that, in fact, there's a dyskinesis of the apex. There's an apical aneurysm that's small, and you're just off plane from it. You couldn't really see it until the contrast was given in. And so it's really important, I think, to to have a low threshold for using contrast. I'm often surprised at how often the diagnosis uh, would have been missed if I had not given contrast. Okay, here comes another case. Um, this one is, is not a great uh, four-chamber view. You have a lot of drop out there, and, and, you know, it's really not clear that you can see the endocardial borders. It's not really clear whether there's a wall motion abnormality or not. And uh, here we go. I'll show you the contrast uh, clip here in just a second. Same patient. And as you look at the contrast here, 
you can see the lateral wall is akinetic. Uh, there's a dramatic wall motion abnormality there that wasn't really evident at all before the contrast was given. So again, an example of why we need to use contrast more often. And there is one little technical flaw on this picture. The focus should be set down at the annulus because you can see there's still quite a bit of attenuation at the uh, mitral annulus level. So uh, this is a patient that we saw just two weeks ago. So this is hot off the press. Uh, a 63-year-old lady came to our hospital with a stroke. Uh, she had been at an outside uh, hospital and was transferred here for treatment of her stroke. And when she got here, it was noticed on her EKG that she had ST elevation in V3 through V6, but with T wave inversions suggesting that maybe she had had an acute anterior MI, you know, maybe three or four or five days ago. Uh, that's what the clinical picture looked like, and so a transthoracic uh, echo uh, was ordered to look at LV function and thrombus. Now, a lot of people would order a TEE here, but remember, if you're thinking this is an apical thrombus due to an MI, a transthoracic echo is the right thing to do. And uh, so here is uh, a picture of uh, her uh, four-chamber view is really more of a five-chamber without contrast, and you can see the wall motion abnormality of the septum extending out to the apex, uh, but you don't really see much else there. Here comes another picture, and now you've, you've given contrast here, and uh, one of the things that uh, looks evident here is, you know, we were concerned uh, that that there was a thrombus in the apex, but you don't really see one here. You get uh, good contrast all the way out to the apex. No thrombus is really seen. Uh, of course, it's possible that there was a thrombus there, and now it's already embolized to her brain, and so you don't see it. But we kept looking, and when we got to a subcostal view, we noticed something that we were not expecting to find, and it's a little bit subtle here, but there is, in fact, contrast in the pericardial space here, just anterior to the right ventricle, right in here, if you can see that. And so now we were very concerned uh, that she might have, in fact, uh, a pseudoaneurysm. And uh, so we continue to look a little bit more carefully. And here you can see this uh, linear uh, tear in the myocardium. She actually has an LV pseudoaneurysm here. And, uh, that's why the contrast is going from her LV into her pericardial space. Uh, she probably did have a thrombus uh, there that migrated, and uh, she went to surgery to have this repaired because this is a life-threatening event. And one of the things where contrast becomes really important uh, for evaluation. All right, so... Uh, Here's another case, and one uh, looks at this, and when, when the fellows saw it, they thought that was the biggest uh, papillary muscle they'd ever seen. Uh, I'll show you some other pictures of this. Here's a uh, short axis view, and you have this large mass here that looks like it's eroding through the posterior wall. And again, it's just a matter of using contrast just to try to see a little bit better of what this is. Here comes another picture. Yeah, here we go. So uh, again, uh, this this uh, mass is not perfused. You don't see microbubbles inside it, but you see a lot of contrast around it. And uh, this actually turned out to be a uh, metastatic uh, cancer. Uh, in this particular patient. So uh, lastly, I'm going to stop with a very interesting case uh, that we saw. I don't know how well this shows up, uh, but uh, this patient has uh, what at first looked like a huge moderator band uh, in the right ventricle here, and then a gap uh, just downstream from it uh, that looks maybe like a VSD. And it wasn't really clear what this was. It was very unusual. And so we decided, uh, you know, to do color flow. And we could see, yeah, that something's going across there. But it doesn't look like a usual VSD does. It's not a really high-velocity 
turbulent jet, so we're still a little bit confused about what this is, and decided we would give contrast. And in fact, what we did first was to give saline contrast. This is just agitated saline, because we thought if this is part of the right ventricle, uh, then saline contrast will get in it. But what you can see here is this cavity uh, has no saline contrast showing up there, so it does not seem to be attached at all to the right ventricle. And so then we uh, come back and give uh, what I believe was Optison uh, in this particular case, and you can see that the Optison goes from the left ventricle uh, and fills this cavity. Uh, so this case illustrates how sometimes it's important not just to use a left-sided contrast agent, but to also use a right-sided contrast agent so you can try to figure out what you're dealing with. And what turns out uh, is this patient had spent time in prison for armed robbery, and during the robbery he was shot in the chest. The bullet went through the right ventricle and actually stopped in the left ventricle, and the trauma surgeons uh, opened him up and pulled the bullet out of his LV apex and put a patch in to exclude the distal RV, connecting the RV apex to the LV, and then closed a hole in the RV free wall. So in this case, the combination of saline and pulmonary contrast was very helpful in sorting this out. And the reason I show this case is not to forget that saline contrast could be very useful in distinguishing right-sided structures. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn the discussion over to Dr. Main uh, from Kansas City, Mike. Thanks, Paul. Uh, just advance to my uh, first slide here, I believe. I'd like to spend just the next uh, 20 minutes or so turning to the topic of ultrasound contrast agent safety and also end uh, with some more information on efficacy and data supporting the regular frequent use of uh, ultrasound contrast agents. Well, as many of you know, there's been a lot of interest in ultrasound contrast agent safety in the past few years, and a little bit of a historical perspective is important. Back in October of 2007, the U.S. FDA made important labeling changes to both Optison and Affinity, and these changes included addition of a boxed warning to the product label for both agents, which highlighted the risk of serious cardiopulmonary reactions, which could occur shortly after administration. The FDA also contraindicated use of contrast in multiple disease states, including patients with worsening or clinically unstable heart failure, patients with acute myocardial infarction, patients with severe ventricular arrhythmias, patients with respiratory failure, and patients with lung disease, like severe emphysema, pulmonary emboli, or other conditions that could cause pulmonary hypertension. They also, at that time, mandated that we monitor all of our patients for 30 minutes following contrast agent administration, including the ambulatory outpatient. Well, why did the FDA do this? They had received reports from healthcare providers of several patient deaths and around 200 what were termed serious cardiopulmonary reactions, which had occurred within several minutes of contrast agent administration. And while there wasn't any good evidence that there was causal relationship between contrast agent and these events, the FDA thought it would be prudent to make these product labeling changes until there was some more data available. Well, the FDA subsequently, in conjunction with the two U.S. manufacturers, Lanthius Medical Imaging and GE Healthcare, designed a total of six safety studies, which have now been performed and results are available. I'd like to just briefly uh, go over those with you because I think they're important to understand. The first was a pulmonary hemodynamic study. This was conducted in patients who had either normal or elevated baseline pulmonary artery pressure. And the objective here was to determine whether there was any change following administration of either Optison or Definity. And as you can see in the first column, there was no change in PA pressure with either Definity or Optison following uh, administration of these agents in the cardiac catheterization laboratory with invasive hemodynamic monitoring. The second study was a critically ill propensity match database study in patients who were hospitalized and underwent echocardiography either with a contrast agent or unenhanced echocardiography. And as you can see, there was no increase in mortality in patients who received an ultrasound contrast agent. In fact, in one of the studies, there was actually a statistically significant reduction in mortality or lower mortality in patients who received an ultrasound contrast agent. The third set of studies uh, consisted of a clinical care registry in about 1,000 patients 
who received who received either Optison or Definity as part of their general uh, care. And as you can see here, there were no deaths and there were no serious adverse events in either of these studies in over a thousand patients studied. Well, in addition to this, in addition to the regulatory studies which have been performed, there's also now a large body of safety literature which has been conducted uh, separate from the manufacturers. A lot of this data was summarized in a meta-analysis published by Kwaja et al. in the American Journal of Cardiology in 2010, and that data is actually summarized here. As you can see, over 200,000 patients in this meta-analysis received an ultrasound contrast agent, and over 5 million patients served as controls. Those patients underwent an echocardiogram without contrast. And the objective here was to determine whether there was any increased mortality risk. As you can see, the pooled odd ratio, pooled odd ratio for all cause mortality across these studies showed there was no increase in mortality. In fact, there was lower mortality in patients who received a contrast agent. So further confirmation that these agents are actually quite safe. Well, an important subset of the Kwaja meta-analysis is shown here, table four from that study. And what we see is in a total of 110,500 patients who received a contrast agent, five, or about one in 10,000, actually had a very serious anaphylactic type reaction. Well, why do these reactions occur? What are they secondary to? Well, we now know there's good evidence that these are what are termed complement activation related pseudoallergy or CARPA reactions. And it turns out that a lot of drugs and agents can actually elicit this type of reaction, things that we use and are familiar with on an everyday basis, things like radio contrast media, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, pain relievers, morphine, liposomal agents, micellar solvents. And what, what are they characterized by? Well, they're a form of a hypersensitivity reaction, but they differ from what we recognize commonly as the IgE-mediated type 1 reactions, these type of reactions that patients get who have allergy to bee sting or penicillin. With an IgE-mediated reaction, the reaction is, actually occurs after repeated exposures, and it's stronger upon repeated exposure. With CARPA reactions, they can occur the first time an agent or drug is administered, and the reaction is typically milder or even absent upon repeated exposure. With an IgE-mediated type 1 reaction, the reaction won't go away without treatment and can be fatal. With CARPA reactions, like we see very occasionally with ultrasound contrast agents, there's oftentimes spontaneous resolution. And finally, with an IgE-mediated type 1 reaction, there's a fairly low reaction rate across the population. CARPA reactions are actually much more common. Well, what do we need to know and how, how should we be prepared to deal with these reactions? In our lab, what we have done is made available allergy kits, and I've listed here an inventory of drugs that we keep in stock. These include uh, beta-2 agonists for inhalation, Benadryl, Lasix, steroids, and the most important thing is to have available an automatic injectable EpiPen to reverse very severe reactions when they occur. As we've said, these are very rare, but when they occur, we need to be ready to treat them. And we think it's important to have these allergy kits, one of which is shown here, available separate from a crash cart for ready accessibility and treatment of these reactions. Well, what about consent? This question comes up a lot. Do we need to consent patients for administration of an ultrasound contrast agent? Certainly, there's a lot of different viewpoints on this. In our lab, we've taken the tact that we do need to uh, obtain informed consent, and shown here is the informed consent that we use. It's a very simple document, and it simply states what we've just discussed, that these agents are very, very safe, but in rare occasions, perhaps one out of 10,000 administrations, a serious allergic type reaction can occur. We inform the patients we know how to recognize these and we know how to treat them. And Of course, most patients are very happy to sign this form just as they would for any other type of imaging test or any other in injectable agent. Well, where do we stand today after all of the safety data has been published and after all of the FDA action uh, has been completed? Shown here is a table from a recent publication outlining changes to the product labeling for one of these agents from the time of product approval in 2001 up through revisions to the product labeling in 2007, 2008, and a final revision in October of this year. If we look at the contraindication line, we see that, of course, these agents are contraindicated if you have a history of previous hypersensitivity, that makes sense. They're also contraindicated in patients with cardiac shunts and they're 
or by intraarterial injection. And what's the reason for contraindication in a patient with cardiac shunt? Well, as Dr. Grayburn outlined in his talk, these microbubbles are very small, smaller than red cells. That's how they gain access to the systemic circulation after intravenous injection. However, about 2% of the microbubbles are larger than red cells. And in a patient with an intracardiac shunt, those larger microbubbles, which would normally be filtered by the lungs, could gain access to the systemic circulation and potentially occlude capillaries causing ischemia, including cerebral ischemia. What about warnings at present? Well, both agents still carry a black box warning. However, there are no longer any disease state contraindications. And in fact, for one of the agents, monitoring is no longer required. We think that's a standard that will probably apply to both agents within the near, very near future. Well, let's move on to some efficacy images and some efficacy data. If you haven't reviewed it already, I would strongly recommend that everybody review the ASC consensus statement on the clinical applications of ultrasonic contrast agent in echocardiography. This document was published in 2008 and really outlines a number of important indications for contrast agent use. It's not just in patients with greater than or equal to two contiguous endocardial borders that aren't well visualized. One of these suggested applications involves the confirmation or exclusion of diagnoses involving the cardiac apex, and those include the apical variants of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ventricular noncompaction, apical thrombus, and then complications of myocardial infarction, such as LV aneurysm, pseudoaneurysm, and rupture, a case of which we've already seen an example today. Let me show you a case, just a typical case that we see in the lab on a frequent basis. This is an 82-year-old man who came to the emergency department complaining of left arm pain and nausea. And this image is not very good. We're tempted when we see it to just read through it and say that this is probably normal. Let's look at the contrast enhanced image. Should be coming up now. And as you can see, following contrast agent administration, there's a large zone of apical dyskinesis. And based on this Imaging that was performed in the emergency department. This patient underwent urgent coronary angiography, which was, of course, important in making a diagnosis. Well, this is a second case, a 45-year-old man with known coronary artery disease. He presented to our practice with a remote history of PCI and had also been told in the past that his ejection fraction was reduced, and he was questioning whether or not there had been any improvement. Well, this baseline image is really quite quite horrible, as I think everybody would agree. There's no endocardial border delineation. We'd be tempted to say we're just not going to be able to make the diagnosis with echocardiography. We went on and administered contrast to this patient. And here are those contrast-enhanced images. This is not going to win any awards, but we're going to be able to make an important diagnosis. As you can see, there's a squared-off ventricular apex, thrombus entirely filling an akinetic apex in this man with previous LAD distribution infarction. Of course, based on these images, he was placed on lifelong oral anticoagulation to prevent a cardioembolic stroke. Let's take a look at another image. This image was acquired in a young woman, a woman in her early 40s, who had been hospitalized for bilateral mastectomy and treatment of breast cancer. And unfortunately, while recovering, suffered an anterior wall ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. She was treated with primary PCI, but developed cardiogenic shock. And in this image, we can see that there's definitely akinesis throughout the LAD distribution, and there's also probably a large thrombus at the cardiac apex. And the question was whether or not she ought to be started immediately on heparin and bridged over to Coumadin for uh, chronic oral anticoagulation. Well, this is the... I can go to the next slide. Actually, I'll go to the previous slide. That one didn't come up. Anybody can see that one. That's the first slide. Let's go to see if we can advance to the second. That looks unfortunately like that image isn't going to play. What we're able to identify or were able to identify on that image is that with contrast, there's absolutely no evidence for apical mural thrombus. We're also able to outline the endocardial borders, calculate ejection fraction and volumes, and based on that, the patient was not placed on Coumadin. She was, however, 
subsequently, or did, however, subsequently undergo ICD implantation for primary prevention of cardiac arrest. Well, those were interesting cases, but we should be guided by data. Is there any data to suggest that we ought to be using ultrasound contrast agents frequently to exclude left ventricular thrombus? This is data from a study by Weinsaft and college, colleagues. It was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology Imaging uh, in 2009. And in this study, 121 patients who are at high risk for LV thrombus due to either previous myocardial infarction or heart failure underwent four tests a non-contrast-enhanced echocardiogram, a contrast-enhanced echo, a CINE MRI study, and a delayed-enhanced CMR, which acted as the gold standard for detection of thrombus. And as you can see, the sensitivity for non-contrast-enhanced echocardiography for thrombus was only 33%, indicating we were missing seven cases out of 10. When we administer contrast, though, sensitivity nearly doubles to 61%. And as was noted in that study, the thrombi that were missed with contrast typically were very small and laminar and probably of much lower thromboembolic or cardioembolic uh, potential. Well, this is some additional data from a study by Curtin colleagues, which we'll discuss in just a little more detail in a few minutes. This is a sub-study or a subtype of this uh, particular study. 632 patients with technically difficult echocardiograms underwent both a baseline echo and a contrast enhanced echocardiogram. Before thrombus, or excuse me, before contrast, 35 patients had a suspected thrombus in the left ventricle. After contrast was administered, only one patient had a suspected thrombus. Before contrast, three patients were thought to definitely have a thrombus. After contrast, none of those patients were thought to have a thrombus. And perhaps just as important, and in addition, five previously undetected thrombi were noted with contrast. And what I think this points out is that in the technically difficult patients, we cannot make an intelligent decision regarding the presence or absence of thrombus without the contrast agent administration. Well, let's look at another case. This is a apical four-chamber view in a 25-year-old woman with a severe non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. She had previously and recently undergone left ventricular assist device implantation with a HeartMate 2 model as a planned bridge to transplantation. And she prevented, presented just for routine surveillance in our echo lab. And I think as you can pretty clearly see, there's an echo lucent zone near or probably outside the left ventricle at the apex. We weren't really sure what that was. And in fact, it's just adjacent to the inflow cannula, which you can just barely see in the medial aspect of this image. Let's go on and show the contrast-enhanced image. After administration of a contrast agent, we can see that there's to and fro flow of blood from the left ventricular cavity into this cavity adjacent to the heart. And there's also a very narrow neck and a large body of this cavity consistent with a left ventricular apical pseudoaneurysm, which we believe occurred as a consequence of trauma just adjacent to placement of the inflow cannula. And based on these findings, she was admitted to the hospital, placed at bed rest, and her status was upgraded to 1A for cardiac transplantation, and she ultimately did undergo transplant within the next several weeks and has done quite well. So I think in this case, the ultrasound contrast agent administration, the contrast enhanced echo was clearly probably life-saving. Well, another problem that we're all facing now in the lab is the obesity epidemic. And this is just some data from a small study we published a few years ago looking at the marked increase in prevalence of super obese patients, those with a body mass index greater than 50 over just a four-year period, a 42% increase in these patients. And this has only increased uh, at a more rapid rate in recent years. And this is just an image, another case a young man, only 18 years old, a BMI of 58 in dyspnea, and we really can't see anything of the endocardial borders based on this non-contrast enhanced examination. Following contrast, however, we're able to calculate an ejection fraction. Probably don't really need to. It's severely reduced with an EF of 11%, globally hypokinetic, no thrombus, and a very large left ventricular end diastolic volume index, an independent prognostic predictor of poor outcome in a patient like this. This is a second case, a similar case. This is also a young woman, 34 years old, a BMI of 64. Again, very, very obese. Heart looks 
probably normal in size and function, but we can't see endocardial borders. When we administer a contrast agent, very, very clearly, we see that the patient actually has hyperdynamic function. So complete contradistinction to the previous case and important, important data in terms of making management decisions for this patient. Well, I'd like to just mention a little bit more about the Kurt study. And if you haven't read or reviewed this study, I'd encourage you to do so. Probably the single most important study in terms of the clinical impact of contrast echocardiography. In this study, 632 consecutive patients with technically difficult studies underwent a baseline study and then a contrast-enhanced echocardiogram. Clinicians caring for the patient were advised of the results of the baseline study and asked what their management decisions would be based on that information. They were called back then a few hours later and informed that a contrast-enhanced echo had also been informed, and they were informed of what the incremental uh, results were based on the contrast-enhanced study. They were asked, are you going to be able to make any management changes now based on this new data? And shown here is the most important uh, figure and data from this study. I'd like to draw your attention to the middle bar, the SICU bar. And what we see here is what types of management changes occurred based on the contrast enhanced study. In blue, procedures avoided. In red, both medication and procedural change. And in yellow, medication changes only. And as you can see, almost two-thirds of patients had an important change in management, which occurred as a result of incremental data based on the contrast enhanced echo. As you can see in the two bars on the left, the inpatient wards and the MICU, this was not uh, a result that was confined to the SICU. About one-third of general hospitalized patients also had important management decisions uh, made based on the contrast-enhanced study. Well, just a couple other lines of evidence and policy statements that ought to encourage us to use contrast on a more frequent basis. The Joint Commission, which accredits our hospitals, recently issued a sentinel event alert warning of the radiation risks of diagnostic imaging. And the quote here states that in order to reduce the exposure of patients to ionizing radiation, use other imaging techniques such as ultrasound or MRI whenever these tests will produce the required diagnostic information at a similar quality level. And as we can see in the patient population we're dealing with today, including the obese patients, patients with lung disease and other difficult to image patients, if we're going to use more ultrasound and more echocardiography, this really mandates that we use ultrasound contrast agents on a frequent basis. And finally, I think most of you are probably aware of the appropriate use criteria, which have been developed for echocardiography, other forms of imaging, and also percutaneous coronary intervention. The most recent iteration of these AUC for echocardiography indicate that when greater or equal to two contiguous LV segments are not seen on non-contrast images, it's highly appropriate to always use contrast when we're performing transthoracic echo, transesophageal echo, or stress echocardiography. So just to sum up, contrast agents are safe. We now know that from a lot of published data, both regulatory studies and peer-reviewed literature, which has been investigator-initiated. There are rare and serious anaphylactoid reactions. We need to be aware of these. We need to have supplies on hand to treat these. And occasionally, we may even have to administer IM epinephrine. These are rare. We just need to be aware of them. With respect to efficacy, we now have good guidelines on when to use contrast. And the contention that these agents not only enhance images, but also positively impact patient outcomes is really well established. So with that, Bev, I'd like to turn things back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Main, and thank you, Dr. Grayburn, for your very interesting and informative presentation. Um, before we begin the question and answer session, I have an announcement regarding um, a change to the stress echo case requirements for accreditation. Um, and as you know, you may submit studies with abnormal wall motion at rest, inducible wall motion abnormalities with stress, and now here's the big news. You may also submit cases using contrast, and the contrast cases may be normal or abnormal. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to turn this over to Linda, and and she can um, present everybody with a question. Linda, I'm here. Hello, Bev. Hello, everybody. Um, we have some questions that were um, given or during the presentation. 
Uh, Samantha has a question that is asking, who can administer the contract? Yeah, this is Paul Graber, and I'll take that. It, it, it's a great question, and it, it's a very local question. It depends on your institution. So many institutions allow sonographers to administer the contrast. Uh, they even train the sonographers to put IVs in and do the whole thing. I actually think that's the best way to do it. And remember that a lot of the uh, IV teams and blood drawers that are used to sticking needles in patients' veins have far less education and uh, credentials than, than our sonographers do. So I think it's perfectly appropriate for sonographers to do this and learn to do it. However, there are some hospitals who insist that it be done by a nurse uh, or insist that it be done by a doctor. So it's, it's very dependent on where you are and what the policies and procedures are at your hospital. Okay, thank you, Dr. Grayburn. Um, there's a question that Samantha also had about what is the reimbursement for Medicare, and I wanted to direct the audience's attention to a link at the lower left-hand corner of their screen with some CPT codes. Uh, I'm not sure which one of you can speak a little bit more about reimbursement. Ever. What is the reimbursement for Medicare? Ray, do you have any information <clears throat> on that? Uh, reimbursement uh, by Medicare is present, and you know there there are very uh, I, most of the problems that I've seen in this area have to do with the way that the um, claim is submitted. I think the best way to answer special questions on this is just first of all to realize that it's reimbursed, and also take advantage of the uh, reimbursement part of uh, contrast zone at the ASD, and there's actually a good. A contact there you can use. Thank you. Dr. Main, can you use contrast on a COPD patient? Uh, I'd say yes, you can, and you usually should. This is a typical patient that has technically difficult images. Lung disease and obesity are probably the two most common reasons that we're unable to get good images. As we said before, way back in 2007, there was some concern that patients with serious lung disease were at increased risk for reactions. There's absolutely no data to support that. And in fact, the data that we just reviewed regarding the pulmonary hemodynamic study shows a very flat response for pulmonary vascular resistance and PA pressure in patients both with normal and elevated pressure. So absolutely safe to use it in COPD, COPD patients, and I would encourage that. Um, Doug has a question about using Definity and uh, Optizon. Uh, Dr. Grayburn mentioned that he used both in his lab. And is there advantage to using one or the other? Probably a question for both of you. They're not they're, I don't think there's really an advantage. They both give uh, very similar images. Uh, I, one thing that if you're going to use an infusion like I prefer to use, it's a little easier to give a Definity infusion. But I, I can't say that one is better than the other. They're both fine. And, and I would agree with that. These are these are similar products. Uh, both are excellent, and uh, both enhance images. Dr. May, I think Rachel has a question for you. She says, "Does the addition of color and the additional ultrasound energy used with Definity in any way contradict or deviate from the safety measurement standards that are in the drug label?" Does the addition of color? Um, not sure she means color Doppler or... Uh, uh, she says, she further says, under the high ultrasound mechanical index, it states that the high index may cause ventricular arrhythmias. Yeah, I think I know what she's getting at. Actually, the product labeling for both agents indicates we shouldn't be using high mechanical index imaging. And there have been some concerns regarding safety. I think most of those have been refuted, it turns out we're not helping ourselves by using high mechanical index imaging. We ought to be using low MI imaging, as Dr. Grayburn outlined, because high MI imaging just destroys microbubbles. So use the presets that the manufacturers uh, uh, will, uh, will educate you on that are already set up on the machines. Use low mechanical index. That allows the, uh, the microbubbles to stay in the circulation and make it to the apex. Uh, and don't, don't worry about using high mechanical index. You're just going to be hurting yourself in your, in your imaging if you do that. 
Mubashir says, are there any new contrast agents that are coming up? Well, the, the, the answer to that is there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, but whether they're going to be available to us is a different story. So uh, it's, it's pretty expensive for a company to, you know, do all of the studies that are required to get through the FDA. And so uh, I can tell you that Bracco, which is a, has an agent that's approved in Europe, is going to be uh, seeking an indication from the FDA. So I would expect that at least that agent called Sonoview will become available in the next couple of years. But there are probably uh, 20 or 30 agents that exist, and uh, I think probably we'll have maybe three, maybe four uh, but they're all similar. There's not a big advantage to any one of them. Okay. Um, Deborah's question uh, is, should you do a bubble study to rule out a shunt before using contrast? I'll take that one. I, I think the answer to that is, is no. Uh, we know that about one out of four patients has a patent for amino valley. And the way I would look at a patent for amino valley is, is not as, as a cardiac shunt. What we're worried about here are important cardiac shunts, large ASDs or other conditions that could cause significant mixing of venous blood into the systemic circulation. So don't worry too much about that. Obviously, if you know a patient has a large atrial septal aneurysm with a big PFO, yeah, I wouldn't use an ultrasound contrast agent in that case, but we don't need to routinely screen for PFOs prior to contrast agent administration. Uh, Bev, this is a question for you. Is it a requirement by IAC to carry an informed consent to use contrast? No, it is not. And I, I think Paul uh, Graeburn spoke to that earlier, That it, or, or Dr. Main. Um, that's basically up to the laboratory. The standards don't require um, consent. So it's, it's basically up to the lab. Arthur's question is, can you comment on time of injection of contrast in stress echo to enable imaging quickly after peak exercise? Basically, is the infusion better than bolus for stress with contrast? I think so. I think the, you know, the difficulty of course, we're in a hurry. We want to grab the images as quickly as possible, but uh, sometimes it, it's it's difficult, uh, and you really want to have that steady plateau. So I still think an infusion is better, even with stress echo. And we we go ahead and get, you know, if you use the 50 cc saline bag with a vial of Definity in it, you've got plenty of time. So we usually start it right before we get them off the treadmill. Um. What is the suggested time allotment for an appointment scheduling for patients who may require contrast? Well, in our lab, we don't schedule patients any longer for a contrast-enhanced study. In fact, I'm of the opinion that it probably shortens the amount of time that it takes to image a patient. I think one thing that's very important is that you identify early on in the study whether or not you're going to use contrast. Don't waste a lot of time trying to get images that you're never going to be able to obtain due to patient-related factors. So what you need to have in place is a, is a fairly slick mechanism for getting an IV uh, catheter or some form of IV access in place, have the contrast agent available, and use it on a regular basis. And what we found is it really doesn't slow us down at all. In fact, probably speeds things up in the end because it decreases the amount of time we're struggling with a patient. Dr. Main, there's a, a few people that are asking some questions about particular types of patients. You answered one question earlier. Um, Jody and then Jessica and Judy are asking about patient that has a PFO or patient um, with a cardiac shunt. Is it safe to use contrast or use affinity uh, on those patients? Well, I think this is similar to the question that we just talked about just a few minutes ago. And the FDA in the, and, the, and, the, and the companies and the product label they don't really give us any guidance on this. What they, what they indicate is that it's a contraindication to use these agents in patients with intracardiac shunts. I don't know what Paul thinks. I have a pretty good idea what he thinks. But I don't think that 
Peyton foramen ovales are an intracardiac shunt of significant size to preclude use of an ultrasound contrast agent if it's otherwise indicated. As we said earlier, only about 2% of these microbubbles are actually larger than red cells. And if you think about the average PFO, when we inject agitated saline, we may see one or two or three bubbles come across with a Valsalva maneuver. I don't think that's sufficient to cause us really any concern. Larger cardiac shunts, like I said, people with congenital heart disease, a large ASD, something like that, I wouldn't use an ultrasound contrast agent. Yeah, I would add to that that, first of all, I completely agree. But I would just add that those of us who go into the operating room and do transesophageal echo in patients undergoing surgery uh, know that the ventricle, the left ventricle, is full of bubbles every time they come off of bypass. And nothing ever happens to the patients. So this idea about not about worrying about a shunt is overplayed. There's never been any data on it. It's just a precaution that they put in the labeling without data just to be, uh, you know, kind of ultra conservative and ultra safe. But really, as Dr. Main beautifully showed, uh, the risk of an adverse event to contrast agents is uh, on the order of 1 in 10,000 patients. So this isn't really a problem, especially when you consider that one out of four people alive on the planet Earth have a PFO. Uh, I'm, I just noticed the time is 7.01. We are going to continue to take a couple more questions. Uh, there are 24 questions in the in the queue right now. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, obviously, but um, let's, let's field a few more. Um, will contrast help in the case of pectus excavatum or large breast implants? You know, it, it, it's just a matter of it will help in any situation where you can't see the endocardial border. Uh, but occasionally you'll get a patient where the windows are so terrible that, that it won't help. And the, the one example that comes to mind is somebody who has subcutaneous emphysema and you can't see it all. But as a general rule, if you can't see the endocardial borders, give contrast. There's a couple of folks that would like you to elaborate on the stress echo protocol with contrast. In other words, the post-imaging drip versus bolus, and um, one institution doesn't use the infusion method. Is there an optimal time um, to avoid shadowing to give the contrast? Yeah, so I, so I find that, that, that with bolus, we get a lot more trouble with shadowing and a lot more trouble with trying to time things. Uh, so I like to use the Definity infusion where we put, you know, a single vial of Definity in a 50cc bag of saline and, and run that in at a nice slow rate and adjust it as needed. So, you know, usually we sort of can get an idea of when the patient is going to finish exercising. With dobutamine, it's a lot easier, but with, with, with exercising, you pretty no, much know when the patient's going to stop. And as soon as they're stopping and rolling over on their side, we get that infusion going and then grab our images. And because it's an infusion, you have, you know, easily got several minutes uh, to, to get the images. So it's really not difficult at all. Um, how do you two feel about using a CVP port to administer Definity? Well, I, I, I don't see that there would probably be any uh, problem with doing that. Uh, these agents obviously are typically administered by peripheral vein injection. Um, shouldn't be really any, any, any problem there, to be honest with you. That's where the bubbles are going to end up anyway within the right atrium, so I think that would probably be fine. You're going to find that they probably need a lower quantity of microbubbles since they're going to get there much quicker and less are going to become stuck in the uh, peripheral veins. My personal opinion, it would probably be fine. I have the last question is uh, from Sarah. Is there any information available on the use of contrast to improve Doppler signals, such as in difficult aortic stenosis cases? Absolutely. Actually, actually, there is a lot of data on that, and I, f I find it not as helpful for for that as as uh, maybe the some of the studies uh, show. Uh, what one of the things that happens is the bubbles give a a huge Doppler signal, and so you get a lot of artifact in the signal. So if you're going to use it to enhance Doppler signals, you've got to wait until the bubbles are almost gone from the picture. 
they're they're still there. But when you have a whole lot of bubbles floating around, you'll get a lot of artifact. Okay, Bev. Okay. Um, if your question wasn't answered during the presentation or you wish to ask your question privately, um, please contact the IAC, um, ICAEL or IAC ECHO team directly. Um, and this concludes today's conference, and thank you all for participating. The survey is presented on the screen for you now to go to the link and, and uh, take the survey. Thank you, everyone.